Jerusalem in the decades after the death of Christ. A city under foreign occupation, plagued by violence. Behind it, a ruthless band of covert operatives known as the Sakari. The modern parallel might be the young men who join Al-Qaeda. They're famed for their fanaticism and their vicious dagger. Let's call them what they are, terrorists committed to overthrowing the existing order by violent means. The Sakari are one of the only guerrilla groups never to bow to the might of the Roman Empire. But finally, the Roman legions pin them down in a seemingly impregnable desert fortress. What happens next is one of the most extraordinary and infamous last stands in history. Jerusalem. In the first century AD, it's an outpost of the Roman Empire. Then, as now, it's a city with a heavy military presence. For the ordinary Jew, the Roman occupation was experienced as living under bullying, brutal, racist soldiery. The Romans weren't uh, Mr. Nice Guys. I mean, uh, they meant business. And if you wouldn't abide by whatever rules they made, then you'd pay the price. And the price often was... They were ruthless. The Roman right was the Roman right. Among the Jewish population, there's widespread but hidden resentment. I imagine that right the way across Palestine, you've got those blank faces that don't reveal anything because there's fear of authority. But behind the mask, there is hatred. It's a hatred that still has echoes in Israel today. Yet there are some who have always been willing to take action. Across occupied Jerusalem, there are a mysterious series of terrorist attacks. The targets were Roman soldiers. The targets were collaborators or anybody who supported the Roman rule. The victims include Jewish religious leaders and tax collectors. These are the people who are enforcing tax payments, tithe payments, rent payments, forced labor, and so on. These people were seen as collaborators, as people who were siding with the foreigners in oppressing the Jewish people. It's a pattern of violence familiar today. The question then, as now, who lies behind it? The answer, members of one of the most fanatical black ops organizations of the ancient world. A group of Jewish assassins known as the Sakari. The Sakari were one of several groups of fanatics, guerrillas, let's call them what they are, terrorists, 
committed to overthrowing the existing order by violent means. I suppose a modern parallel might be the young men who join Al-Qaeda. It's that kind of real determination, real anger boiling over into militant action against the authorities. The Sakari fighters are motivated by a deeply held belief in God, freedom and the independence of their country. They're strictly observant Jews. Their goal, the complete removal of Roman rule. It's not that they wouldn't accept a Roman rule, they wouldn't accept any rule, only God's rule. The Sicarii felt that they had an obligation to cleanse the Holy Land, the promised land that had been given to them by God, of all of the defilement, the involvement of foreigners in the governance of Palestine. There was to be an apocalyptic cleansing. These fiercely held beliefs turn members of the Sicarii into fearless assassins, happy to embrace a martyr's death. <laughs> but opposition to Rome is not easy. The Roman legions are overwhelmingly the most powerful fighting force of the ancient world. The Sicarii must fall back on their few advantages their knowledge of Jerusalem's narrow streets, their ability to mingle with the crowds, and their understanding of the people. They know how far it is from one place to another. They know the shortcuts. They know the escape routes. They speak the language. They don't need interpreters. That gives you force multiplication. It's known today as asymmetric warfare. The poorly equipped terrorist against the might of an occupying army. In the 8060s, Jerusalem becomes a city living on its nerves. The mastermind behind the Sakari is a religious fanatic called Menachem ben Yair. Like many of his kind, he claims direct authority from God. He's motivated by a deep hatred of Roman rule. Menachem seems to belong to a family of revolutionary fighters going right back to the middle of the previous century. He's a very brave revolutionary. You had to be because of the repression. His task, to turn his band of religious zealots into a disciplined fighting force. The Sicari's chosen weapon is a curved knife known in Latin as a Sicarus. It's perfectly designed for stealthy, sneak attacks. You can hide it under robes, you can tuck it under a cloak, even have it in a basket. It's also devastatingly effective. It can curve around shields, and curve around a defense, and cut through lots of flesh and all the way down to the bone. They were aiming for surgical strikes at individual soldiers, individual officers, individual servants of the Roman state. Menachem is a natural organizer, wily, shrewd, and experienced. 
He plans each attack to make maximum use of his limited resources. If you're going to send guys into action, if they're going to carry out assassinations, they have to be very, very carefully planned. His first all-important question, who to target? You don't choose a target lightly because you're going to have to direct some of your best assets at that target. Like terrorist groups today, the symbolism of the target is all important. If your target's big enough and you can do it, the very act of killing that target makes a massive statement. There's a kind of propaganda of the deed about what the Sicarians are doing demonstrating to the common people you can hit back effectively and there's a possibility that if we all move together we might actually cleanse Palestine of these outsiders. With the target selected, it's time to move on to the next stage. What happens next has become a routine part of the training of all special forces. The target is tracked. Observers watch his every move. They need answers to a number of critical questions. What's the target's vulnerability? What kind of security has he got? Is he conscious of being a target? In order to determine all that, we need to look at what we call pattern of life. His usual movements, his comings and goings, wherever he goes to the pub, wherever he has a drink habit, wherever he goes to the market at 12 o'clock on a certain day. Gradually, the observers build a detailed pattern of the target's lifestyle. It's a long process. It's a detailed process and people's lives depend on it. Meanwhile, the Sakari hitmen are put through intensive training. It's more than just knife fighting. It's psychological preparation. You need an extreme amount of aggression or cold-bloodedness to carry out such an action. It's something that's beyond most people. Not everybody can kill close up in cold blood. It's an extremely messy and difficult job to pull off. It's intense, it's personal, you're gonna get covered in that person's blood. The trick is to practice on something that simulates the real experience. I know from the paras we practice intensely carrying out bayonet attacks on sandbags full of chicken innards and, uh, and pig blood. Just uh, to go through the machinations of sticking a knife into an object and withdrawing it and seeing blood and guts come out. It's something best left to spies and other cold-blooded individuals or assassins. Every aspect of the mission is exhaustively rehearsed. Finally, the details are checked one last time. Target identified. Routine established. Training complete. Weapons distributed. It's time to make the hit. A Sakari hit squad infiltrates the crowd. Their techniques are familiar to special ops units today. They would go in broad daylight, they go to the market, you mingle among hundreds or maybe thousands of people. You will have people watching all the time, teams dedicated to reconnaissance. The reconnaissance team locates the target. Are there any signs of unexpected danger? 
finally the mission gets the go-ahead. Discover the past with exclusive ancient history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to explore everything from the wonders of Pompeii to the rebellion of Boudicca and the mysteries of prehistoric Scotland. Immerse yourself in the captivating stories of this remarkable era by signing up via the link in the description. Now it's the turn of the strike team. The hitman, the strike team, very lightly armed because he wants to attract as little suspicion as possible. The assassin moves into position. There's a rush of emotions familiar to all Black Ops assassins. Your spine feels like it's injected with ice. You're full of fear, adrenaline, excitement, a buzz. But at the same time, you need to control all of that so you're coordinated. The hitman quietly unsheathes his weapon and waits for the exact moment. It doesn't take long to make that strike. Two seconds. Get in close. Strike hard. Strike often. Before you yourself are overwhelmed. Then the Sakari melt back into the crowd. They kill the man, drop the daggers, and then become part of the crowd, reeling in shock at this terrible murder that happened. Who could have done it? Almost immediately, fear spreads through the crowd. You can imagine how quickly the rumors of a new killing would have gone through the streets. To add to the confusion, the Sakari join in the hue and cry. They'd start yelling, whoa, what happened, what happened? And people would get confused who did it. This is what asymmetric warfare is all about. What they're demonstrating is that they can strike anywhere, anytime. Camouflage in, cover out, increase of demonstrative effect. The Sakari know that with just a few men, they can put a whole city on edge. It's a tactic familiar to security forces worldwide. You make that market very unsafe, not for the Sicari, but for the other people, because you don't know who the enemy is and who, who is not. And so you create an, an atmosphere of uncertainty, you create an atmosphere of fear, of anxiety, and that's what they wanted. What terrorists are about are not eroding the enemy forces through killing them. They're about making statements. If we can get him, we can get you. It's classic guerrilla warfare. The Sakari know a Roman response is inevitable. In the year AD 66, the Romans crack down. The man in charge is Gessius Florus the governor of Jerusalem. Gessius Florus is from a town in what is now Turkey. Uh, so he's a member of the provincial aristocracy, not the Latin-speaking Roman aristocracy, very much, therefore, a man on the make. 
For Floris, this is an opportunity to shine in front of his masters in Rome. In a now infamous command, he orders his men to steal treasures housed in the second temple on Jerusalem's Temple Mount. This is the great holy center for all Jews. Symbolically, to do something like this for the temple where God is, you know, where the holy of the holiness, oh, I mean, no, 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 no. The psychological uh, impact of such a thing is, is tremendous. Here they remove the equivalent of a quarter of a million pounds of treasure in lieu of unpaid taxes. It's an act of sacrilege. It's difficult to imagine anything that could have angered the Jews of Jerusalem more than that. There were people who were willing to die for that. The reaction follows a familiar pattern. Outraged Jews gather on the streets of Jerusalem. There are noisy demonstrations. The mood in Jerusalem after this attack on the temple treasury was, was absolutely electric. It provokes Floris into making a serious mistake. He sends in troops to restore order. Protesters are publicly whipped. Some 4,000 people are executed or crucified. But like dictators through the ages, Floris has misjudged the popular mood. The whole of the city rises in revolt. <laughs> Jerusalem's Jewish population turns on the Romans. tens of thousands of new, young Jewish fighters on the streets determined to cleanse the city of this alien, infidel, pagan presence. A little bit like the way in which you imagine it kicking off in parts of the Middle East when it's the uh, Islamic resistance fighters who suddenly find that they've got mass recruitment on their hands. Flores has unwittingly played into the hands of the Sakari. Menachem gains a flood of new recruits. Suddenly, all the young guys in that street want to join the resistance because they can see that there's a massacre happening on their own streets. And who do they go to? They go to the local Sicarian because they know that those are the guys who organize the resistance. But the sheer number leave the Sakari with a problem. There are simply not enough weapons to go round. The solution? To steal them from the Romans. That summer, Menachem leads a group of Sakari warriors in a stealthy guerrilla raid. They travel to an isolated Roman fort on the shores of the Dead Sea. Here, they break in. They overwhelm the garrison, seize the armory, and use those arms to equip themselves as the revolution begins to take off. The hall includes swords, daggers, 
and javelins. Armed with new weapons, Menachem hurls his recruits into the attack. They felt that they, they have nothing to lose. They have to, you know, stand up to the rights and fight and throw the Romans out because it's their country. Within weeks, the Roman garrison in Jerusalem is overrun. The Romans are forced to flee the city. Jerusalem has been liberated. But it soon starts to go wrong. The newfound Jewish unity falls apart. The Jewish elite, led by the high priests, argue that in the long run, Rome can never be defeated. It's time to cut a deal. The Jewish moderates are looking for a deal because in the past, they've done rather well out of the collaboration with Rome. They want to talk to the Romans. They want to reach some kind of compromise settlement with the Romans. But the Sakari will have none of it. Factions form. Hardline guerrilla groups like the Sakari are not interested in negotiation. As far as the Sakari are concerned, there's to be no compromise. We're going to go the whole way. This is a revolution that is going to cleanse the Holy Land of infidels and of injustice. Once again, Jerusalem erupts into fighting. But this time, it's Jew against Jew. There was a struggle for, for, for control, a struggle for leadership. Each faction claims authority from God. Imagine, you know, you have God sitting on your lap, and God tells you that if you're a real good Jew, this is what you should do. And you have other Jews who says, well, God sits on my lap, and God tells me differently. Then what are you going to do? In a series of running battles, the Sakari kill moderate Jews and priests. But then they go too far. The Sakari attempt to impose their own extremely pious form of religious law on the rest of the city. how the city should look like, how people should act, what they should eat, how they should pray. You don't do this? Forget it. I mean, if you're not with me, you're against me. You're dead meat. The Sakari have overreached themselves. The population of Jerusalem rises up against them. Their leader, Benachim ben Yair, is killed. <gasps> the Sakari are forced to pull out. They fled the city. They didn't just march out, uh, you know, to the sound of drums on red carpets. They fled as quickly as they could before they were all killed. They decide to return to what they know best, guerrilla warfare. They may have been beaten, but they're not defeated.
they choose as their base the almost impregnable Roman fortress at Masada. Masada is an extraordinary place. It's an immensely powerful natural fortress. And you have the fortified palace right at the top of these sheer cliffs. An incredibly difficult position to attack and capture. So it's a perfect camp for a guerrilla unit that's going to be raiding in the surrounding countryside. The Sakari's new commander is Elazar Ben Yair, a relative of their assassinated leader and a veteran of the fighting in Jerusalem. Elazar, like all Sakari, is a religious fanatic who claims to receive orders from God. He must have been not just a very determined fighter, but a very charismatic man as well. You look at the decisions that apparently had to do with him, and you realize you have a ruthless person. I suspect you're dealing with psychologically a very strong person, a very committed person, a pious Jew, somebody who wouldn't take no for an answer and uh, would go all the way, all the way, I mean, to death. The Sakari rebels are joined at Masada by their wives and children. It's said that by AD 71, there are hundreds of men, women, and children living in the fortress. We know quite a lot about this community at Masada because there have been excavations which have told us a lot about how they were living their daily lives. Masada becomes a guerrilla headquarters, crossed with a religious community. We have to imagine, I think, uh, a, a simple community, but a very religious, a very devout community as well. It's not a comfortable place. Food and water are a constant problem. Masada is a tough place to live. I mean, uh, temperatures are extremely hot. If you don't have water, if there is not enough rainfall, then, you know, you, you have a problem because you also have to accumulate the waters for, uh, for the summer. The conditions force the Sakari to take violent measures. They were equipped for that. They had the knives, they had the ideology, and they had God. You don't want to argue with that. Elazar's plan? To raid surrounding villages. Once again, the Sakari follow modern special force procedures. Each raid is carefully planned. The key to a successful guerrilla raid is reconnaissance, reconnaissance, reconnaissance. It's a mantra closely followed today. You want to know how many people are in a particular given village. What weapons do they have? Is there a security force? Are there any garrisons nearby that could cause you difficulty? What is your way in going to be? And of course, because your purpose is to gather supplies or weapons or money, you need to get out too. It's a big job to, to do it properly because failing in any of those respects compromises the entire team as well as the operation. One of the best recorded raids is on the small oasis village of Ayn Gedi. It's a brutal attack. Yes! 
hear the Sakari steal food and seize whatever they can find of value. We know that they chased the Jews out, killed 700 women and children, took all the food supplies to Masada. And it probably reflects other raids they did. But they don't just need food. They also need money. Along the shores of the Dead Sea, there's one obvious source of it. One of the commodities they were seizing was balsam, which was an immensely valuable fragrance that was widely used in the ancient world. Balsam is an aromatic, pleasantly smelling resin. It comes from plants that grow widely in the surrounding area. It was one of the ancient world's most lucrative trades. It seems Elazar's aim is to control the balsam market. I imagine that they were selling it on and perhaps using it a little bit like the way in which the Taliban today use opium to fund their armed resistance. Three years after leaving Jerusalem, the Sakari camp at Masada is the last pocket of resistance to Roman occupation of the Holy Land. Finally, the Romans lose patience. They unleash the full military might of Rome on the mountain stronghold. The man in charge is a politician and general called Flavius Silva. Flavius Silva was a very experienced military commander, a determined person. He knew what he was doing, he knew how to do it, and he was very successful in his raids. Whatever objection he, he encountered, he was able to, to overcome. He brings with him a force of up to 15,000 legionnaires and thousands more Jewish prisoners of war. Soon messengers arrive from lookout points around Masada. The fortress is completely surrounded. The Romans are laying siege. From the top of the rock, you would look down and you would see the siege lines forming all around you. 15,000 Roman soldiers, many thousands of Jewish prisoners who were being used to do hard labor. It's a terrifying sight. Silva's scheme is to isolate the Sakari from the surrounding villages. He uses prisoners of war to build a wall around the entire mountain. It's designed to stop the Sakari leaving and supplies arriving. It's still there today. In a way, what Eleazar faces is the very opposite of what a guerrilla fighter is seeking to do. Suddenly, the Sakari lose the one advantage they have, their mobility. They turn their advantages of mobility, of presence amongst the people, into disadvantages, because they then found themselves fixed to a position, lightly armed, and probably with very little military idea of how to defend themselves properly against a highly disciplined, very motivated, well-trained, and extremely ruthless force. Meanwhile, Flavius Silva studies the terrain and makes an important discovery. 
Masada is not as impregnable as it appears. Masada had an Achilles heel, and the Achilles heel was the, the west side. Running up this flank is a natural spur of rock. Here, Silva orders the prisoners of war to build a ramp up the mountain. Is this a major operation? Eh. I mean, Roman engineers were very good. They, they cracked other fortresses. The Romans legions were not trained for a moving battle. They were trained to crack fortresses to fight back and forth. Once you choose to sit in a fortress, you're doomed. Elazar rallies his followers. They fight hard to obstruct the Roman ramp. sending down volleys of rocks. Ah! But it's useless. Late one night, Huddled groups of Sicarii and their families hear the Romans battering at the fortress walls. They face a terrible choice, fight on or surrender. It was clear that the Romans are going to breach in, going to enter the, the fortress, and uh, what choices do you have? That was a terrible night. What they face the following morning is the Roman army breaking into Masada, probably killing all of the men, almost certainly raping all of the women and possibly killing them or then enslaving them, possibly killing their children or if not enslaving their children. But for the Sakari, surrender is not an option. Fanatical groups like the Sakari never surrender. They never surrender because what their aims are are not negotiable. Therefore, from their perspective, the only solution is to fight on to the bitter end, fight on to the death. We see it time and time again in history, whether it be the ancient world with the Sicarii, all the way up to the modern day with Al-Qaeda elements. And the only way to uh, end the situation is to annihilate them. Unable to surrender, Elazar is left with only one option. He takes a fateful decision that still shocks today. Elazar makes an impassioned speech. He tells his followers. Since we long ago resolved never to be servants to the Romans, nor to any other than to God himself, let our wives die unabused, our children without knowledge of slavery. It's a call for mass suicide. According to the Roman account, the Sicarii set fire to the fortress. Immediately afterwards, they follow Elazar's plea. What they did was quite extraordinary, extraordinarily brave. Each man killing his own wife and his own children. Oh. 
the worst crime imaginable, in a sense. And then among the men, 10 were selected by lot to kill the others. Men that they had fought with through long years of hard struggle. And then among those remaining 10, one man taking the responsibility for killing the other nine. And then, before this sea of corpses, killing himself. When the Romans finally enter the fortress, they're confronted by an appalling sight. In the words of an eyewitness account, there was an awful solitude, flames within, and silence. The suicide pact is quite difficult to understand psychologically until you put it into the context of a powerful religious movement where people think that they are the soldiers of God, that what they are doing is deeply righteous, where it becomes preferable to end your own life and presumably enter the presence of God than to face enslavement or rape or slaughter at the hands of your enemies. Even battle-hardened soldiers are shocked. Only two women and three children are said to have survived. It's an horrific end to one of the most successful campaigns of resistance to Roman occupation in the ancient world. Today in Israel, the Sakari are remembered by many not as terrorists, but heroic freedom fighters. Hundreds of thousands of tourists flock to the site of their last stand at Masada every year. Their rebellion has become the staff of myth and legend. It's even said the disciple who betrayed Jesus, Judas Iscariot, got his name from the Sakari. Whatever the truth, the Sakari remain for many people the most fearsome black ops assassins of the ancient world. Ah!